Hello, gang. Thank you for joining me. Gonna make a few <clears throat> measurements on the, the bottom of Joe's coat here. Oh, wow. Oh, no, I'll tell you, it's right down there. There we go. Uh, hello, my name is Dan. For about four years, I did daily art adventures for anybody who's wondering why the sort of strange names. <laughs> it's because I did daily art adventure for four years, did over a thousand broadcasts, and then my lifestyle changed, so I'm not doing it as much. So now we're doing Dan's art adventure. <laughs> Oh, I need to start putting those in the description online, don't I? Sorry about that. D-A-A, -A, Dan's Art Adventure number 18. Woohoo! And, uh, yeah, number 18, torso and other stuff on Sarah and Joe. Sarah is Foxhole Willie's daughter, for you regulars, who know, recognize that name. I think it's okay for me to give him his real name. Foxhole Willie is actually Jim. Another one of my uh, New Jersey friends. I, I believe. I think it's New Jersey, right? <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk about what, what's happened. I did some painting without your company. Hello, Tiago. <laughs> you got here before it started. Good for you. All right, let's zoom right in on their faces. In fact, I'll, I'll you bring you in real close and straight on just for a minute, so you can so you can see them. So there's the painting, and here's the foot. You can't even tell the difference, can you? <laughs> okay, so I'm down to the point where eventually, no matter how many um, photomechanical tricks you use, no matter how many measuring, gridding, tracing, whatever it may be, eventually it comes down to your eyeballs. <laughs> so I'm at that point here. Um, just a quick review for those of you who weren't for here for the earlier broadcast. Uh, the first photomechanical trick I used, this, this is printed out the same size as my painting. By the way, I do the painting first and then make this to match the painting. Um, and there's a, I don't know if you can see, there's a real fine red line right there and right there. And then I would use dividers, calipers, compass, whatever, to measure. See all these little dots on Joe's face? Those were all, those were all uh, anchor points, measuring points. So I, I came up with the corresponding dot all here. For some reason, I just didn't use as many dots on Sarah's face. So that was step number one. And then in one recent broadcast, I showed this how I did this, and I'm not going to show you again other than this is, I took a picture of the painting and a picture of the photograph, that's redundant, sorry, and then flopped it. So these two pictures up here are a mirror image of the painting, right? She's supposed to be facing that way, and here she's facing this way, all right. And because it's a mirror image, I could see my mistake, so I made a note of 14... No, 18, 18 different tweaks that I needed to do to her face. That I took all these 18 notes and transferred them down to here, always looking back at the photograph to see if I agree with myself. <laughs> and then I painted from this. Same thing with Joe. So when I had finished that process, honestly, uh, by the time I got that far, um, I was quite happy with the likeness and then a little bit yesterday sorry for forgive me again i painted without your company 
um, where I did this, what I just described is just painting by eye. And by that time, it comes down to, I know, I know that all my measurements are exactly correct, but there's, there are a thousand things you can't measure, like how quickly the edge of the cheek fades from light to dark, from light to shadow, right? Things like that you can't measure. And, you know, how much of the, how much of the top lip, sh anyway, so all that kind of stuff. <coughs> so yesterday when I was painting, I just, I had this up here. And um, I just looked at this and my painting and went back and forth. Now, one thing I haven't done yet, <coughs> which is a helpful tip for me, is I haven't asked my wife. <laughs> because every time I do, I'm disappointed. <laughs> because she tells me the truth. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of kidding, but I will, you know, I'll, I'll have her come in and say, okay, what do you think? And she will tell me. Well, I think blah, blah, blah. For instance, right now, just looking at it right now, I see that, and this is definitely the kind of thing I would need to put on my Superman glasses. The opposite is true. If I was really Superman, I wouldn't need the glasses, but you know, X-ray vision glasses. I can see that the, the dark, I have a dark line at the bottom of her teeth. And there is one here, but my dark line is too dark. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to do it right now, but that means I'd pick up a little, tiny little brush like this, get the right color paint on it, and just come down and just bring, drag the white, drag the white paint of her teeth down just a tenth of a millimeter so that that line isn't quite so distinct. Stuff like that. Get it? But that's not what I'm going to do in this broadcast. That, uh, you know, to broadcast that kind of painting would just be put everybody to sleep so because it's so minute so I'm gonna do something a little bit I hope a little bit more interesting than that in this broadcast and that is start working on their torsos and I've already done a little bit of work but not too much so yeah okay there we go so this picture that's already here, I, I drew the lines on here again, corresponding to what's on the photograph, on the painting, I mean. And I was just, when, the, when you signed on, I was just starting to, uh, <laughs> you know that guy. Oh, in Maryland, sorry, Joe. Joe. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. <laughs> Maryland. <laughs> to those of us not from that part of the country, you know, Maryland and New Jersey kind of run together. Forgive me. That, I'm from Michigan, so people say, oh, yeah, Minnesota, right? <laughs> I had the same problem. Um, so I, uh, just before I started the broadcast, while I was waiting for everything, I also did a little bit of measuring then. To make you know, to make sure I've got like the the end of Jim's coat. By the way, I, I do have a, a smaller version of the full image up there above me. I can reference at any time, but it's not the not the same size. So, all right. So I was just starting to fix. I've got I've got Jim essentially fixed all the way all the way down to his shirt and boutonniere and, and so on. All these things. All these lines up here are pretty carefully measured. So once again, if, if your eye, or my eye, if, if, if one's eye says something's not right, it's usually at this point then, it's not a, what I'll call a macro measurement. It's usually some, some other thing is causing us to get the, 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 the impression that it's wrong. All right, now, Look, real quick, how do you, um, hang on for a second, I, I am going to tape up another photograph while I paint Jim's um, suit coat. 
All right. How do you paint a, I usually call it a highly variegated, a little bit too big of a word really, but just an object that is shadowed, rounded, and so on and so forth. It, there is a formula. And if you don't know what to do, until you are a better painter than me, uh, follow my formula, which is real simple. And this applies to faces, a little bit, hair, everything. Sky, clouds, grass, foliage. The answer is mid-tone over everything. That's what you've just seen me do. Mid-tone, dark details, light details, in that order. Okay, so mids, darks, light. So I just did a mid-tone blue over Ju Joe's, <laughs> <What's it? laughs> over Joe's um, jacket. Now I'm mixing up with the same two brushes, a dark, a little bit of, don't tell anybody, I used a little bit of black. Um, okay, now I'm looking at just, I can't measure by this image now because it's, of course, it's smaller, but I can still use compare. So the, the front of his sleeve is even with the top of this flower. about the, almost the width of the flower over. So right now I'm just doing plain old fashioned drawing, looking, looking, looking. There's a pocket, about two thirds down of that flower right there. And there's a shadow under the flower. So I've got, it's, I hope you can see I've got dark, uh, Dark blue paint. There's a notch, the notch in his collar is about even with the middle of his bow tie. In other words, middle of bow tie there, straight across. I'm looking at the photograph to get all these. This is Again, what I'm doing now is plain, old-fashioned drawing. Uh, let's get the the arc, arch, arc of his shoulder, shoulder pads actually in a suit like this, right? You know what? Something doesn't feel right to me here. Hang on, I'm going to go back to uh, go back to this. Right here now, as I said, there's, there's often, if something doesn't feel right, it might be something else, but this, okay, this dot right here. I can still barely, barely, barely make out where the uh, that measurement line, I really can't see it, but I can tell where it was. I need, need a pencil, here we go. <clears throat> All right, this far down. Right there. Right there. Ooh, yeah, okay, good, good. I'm almost an eighth of an inch off. Whew! So my eye was, my eye was telling me right that time. There's, somehow I managed to... Uh, now, let's check this this one right here. There's a dot right there. I don't know if you can see that on his, on his shoulder blade. Okay, maybe a sixteenth of an inch shy there. <clears throat> All right, glad I, that was something, something was not right. And it, I was correct that something was not right. So I'm gonna mix up a little bit more medium dark blue and uh, redraw this line right here. That's too dark. Call in the titanium white. Da, 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 da. Still too dark.
All right, now back to the back to the dark that I was doing. Once again, don't tell anybody, but I actually used a tiny bit of black. <laughs> that old art school adage, don't use black, is true to a point. I know, I know what the professors mean when they say that. The reason they say it is because often an early journey painter, a beginner painter, if they want to make they're mixing colors. They want to make some color darker. They just go, well, black. And that's that's the impulse that the the adage, the old statement, don't use black. That's what it's addressing. And in that case, it's exactly correct. No, you don't normally use black. But really, once you get a little bit more mature in your painting, you'll discover that what, what the adage should be is don't misuse black. All right, and I already measured this a little bit right here. I discovered, discovered I have the, her dress, her veil really. It doesn't come out far enough there, so that's corrected a little bit. All right, back to dark details. I was going to do the, his shoulder comes also to the middle of his bow tie. So that's right about there. And it fades down in both directions. Do a little bit of shading, blending. Okay, now let's look for just a second at the, uh, the wrinkles in his jacket. Um, you can of course, paint forever fabric. I mean, I, that's a really good art school exercise. If you're doing it, learning how to do realism, just throw a piece of, drape a piece of fabric over a chair in front of you and paint it accurately. Um, you know, the old masters, Renaissance painters did, did, were so good at that. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to take enough time to do what they did. It's just not. So the way I paint is my faces are tight, accurate, photographically realistic, I hope. And um, the background of the painting is typical Dan Nelson impressionistic perhaps, what I prefer to call abstract realism, where the abstract elements, line, shape, color, design, value, texture, are more, are paramount, are more important than the picture, than the picture elements. Uh, but the, the, the bride and groom's torsos, physique, bodies, figures, are halfway in between. Therefore, I'm not going to do Joe's sleeve to the same degree of realism as his face. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to do the Renaissance thing. But I do want to get very close. I want it to be very believable. All right. So I've basically done the midtone and the dark details. Now, I'll wipe off these brushes. I don't have to clean them. I just want to wipe them off. Uh, now, let's go back and do the light details. Oh, by the way, sometimes, often, uh, I do a lot of wedding paintings, as you know, and very often the uh, groom is wearing a black tux. By the way, that's the, pretty much the only time you do use black. That's an, that's an extreme statement. Is when you're painting a black object. That's another story. I'll leave it for now. <laughs> Gouache. Excellent, Brenda. Good to have you on board. Sorry you can't sleep. Um, oh, I was going to say, so often when I have to paint... Uh, uh, oh, I have, an, I have a sample here. Hang on. When I have to paint a black tux and the photograph doesn't... doesn't 
say very much. So here's, this is the other wedding painting that I have to get working on really quick. So as you can see, um, Kate Jack is wearing a black tux and my camera, my print here picks up almost nothing. So in Photoshop, now you could do this on your phone as well, I believe, but this case, in this case it was in Photoshop, I, I isolated that tux and I bumped the exposure way up so that look at it's kind of interesting my camera my camera is actually seeing a whole lot more in here than i can even see with my with my bare eye so i do that trick so that i i'm not going to paint it this light but this helps me to see the light details so there's a trick worth doing i didn't need to do this i didn't need to do that on uh, on joe's suit because it's dark blue and it seemed to, to me that I was seeing enough uh, enough details without doing that. All right, so I'm over here mixing up a lighter color. And by the way, according to my photographs, and I think these are accurate, his suit is actually tends toward a warm gray. I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. Warm blue. Uh, like a phthalo blue instead of a cool blue like ultramarine. So ultramarine is a little bit more purplish and a phthalo is more greenish, therefore warm. And some of you will say, well, are confused. Uh, never mind. I've, I've done that so many times. I don't want to do it again. Um, just understand that there is such a thing as warm and cool blues, warm and cool yellows, warm and cool reds. And the warmest color is yellow-orange, in my humble opinion, okay? So if you take a color wheel and just put the yellow-orange straight up at the top, that's like true north, then the closer you get to that, the warmer it is. The further you get away from that, the cooler it is. So then when you find blue down here, you know which way is warmer. I don't know if you caught that, but that's all I'm going to say about it. So I have a, a little bit of phthalo blue, a little bit of ultramarine. It's not, it's not pure uh, phthalo. It's got some, it's not as warm as that. And um, and some uh, raw umber which some of you will remember, some of you regulars will remember. Raw umber is my go-to color for killing color. Anytime I want to push the chroma down, uh, my favorite color for doing that is raw umber. And in fact, It, the floor shakes, so I have to stop when you go through. <laughs> My dear wife, she's trying so hard to walk quietly behind me. <laughs> Our crazy house that we live in, sheesh. Somebody walking by makes the floor shake. Yeah, raw, oh, and I was going to say, and not only that, not only raw umber for, is my favorite color killing color, color killing tube of paint is raw umber, but not only that, but student grade. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's typically, student grade paint has a lower pigment concentration than good quality paint. And since I'm using raw umber almost exclusively for killing color, I don't want to have to measure or be careful. I don't want to have to be real careful when I get it and not get too much. So I like, I like the freedom that it gives me. I just stick my brush, it, brush in it and pick up a, 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 blo a blob, a, a dab of yellow ochre, and it's usually not too much. So.
There's a silly little tip if you want one. Student grade thought number. That just means the cheap stuff. You don't have to ask me which which student grade. Now just go to your art store or online and buy the, the, in this case it's Soho, but if you don't have a Jerry's Artorama in your town, then you won't even know what that is. So don't worry about it. The only downside, in my opinion, of student grade paints is you do have to watch out for um, light fastness. Don't don't buy something that's going to uh, fade in 10 or 20 years. And usually the more dull colors are less fugitive, are, are more stable than than the bright colors. So yellow ochre is, I mean, sorry, yellow ochre, why did I say that? <laughs> Raw umber is, is a very dark dull color, so it's probably very permanent because it has things in it like carbon. <laughs> Carbon's pretty, pretty much, you know, it'll be here when the world is melting away into nothingness. Carbon will still be here. <laughs> I'm, I've just picked up a smaller brush now to uh, come back and do more uh, dark stuff. And now, as you can see, I'm painting with the horrible death control grit. I think I might pause there and let that let this dry for a day, and then uh, come back and look at it tomorrow and make any modifications that are needed. And then I'll be painting uh, in dry into into dry paint, of course. So that will make modifications a little bit easier. Let me do some, real quickly, some little reflections on his buttons. All right. I did some painting on this um, last night and most of what I did last night is not, is not dry, so. And that's partly, by the way, because I don't have my normal, my normal fast dry titanium. I have instead a Graham fast dry formula, but it's not as fast as the alkyd that I normally use. All right, let's. I'm going to actually clean all these brushes. That's enough for Joe's jacket for right now. Let's go over to uh, Sarah. One of the last things I did last night is I, I did some real thick impasto on the top of her dress right here, which looks great. The only downside is um, it's caused the, the, the applique, I don't know what you call it, all the fancy fabric on her dress is too exaggerated here. So after this dries, and it's not dry now, I'll come in and diminish some of those dark marks so that it looks more realistic, but that'll, that'll do for now. I'm going to move my canvas up just a little bit. All right, and you could probably see I've already done some pencil lines here. Uh, measuring, again, using 
using the uh, compass or dividers, whichever you want to call them, you know, me measuring from the lines and so on. So I have that pretty accurate. Oh, one one thing that I have done is I've elonged from, from here down, I've elongated the figures, of course, just a little bit, not much, but a little bit. And um, I just got started last night before I quit painting. I just got started doing part of her dress down here. You can see it's way too dark here, of course. And that's because I'm, I was aiming for um, this shade right here which is really a surprisingly dark brown for a white dress. Again, over here, maybe you can see. So darks first, lights last. So I did the darks first there. So let's do, I don't know at this point exactly what color, that, as you, I hope you can see, they, they are standing in front of a, a dock, a pier, right? And the wood of that dock or pier, we see it on each side of them. We see it down here at the bottom. I don't know what color that's going to be. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I'm guessing it'll be some kind of neutral gray, a light color, neutral gray brown, brownish gray. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, based on that guess, I'm going to put some n a light neutral gray, almost as a placeholder, because this defines the front of his leg and the back of hers. And of course, I may come back and change that color later when I paint everything else. I'm like, oh, that's not the right color. This this is also, this is a little confusing right here. So if, if I can figure out some way to make that, in other words, the angle of the pier is almost exactly the same as the angle of her thigh. That's not, not very ideal. Once again, I'll probably leave it that way for now and uh, see if I can figure out some way, use probably through color or value uh, to make that more. I don't want people to get her thigh confused with the, the wood, but the wood of the pier is, you know, pretty much has to be just like that. <clears throat> so we'll see how I resolve that. I'm hoping I can just do it by making the front of her dress very, very, very white, which it, in fact, is in the photograph. And I hope that'll be adequate. All right, now to her dress. I've painted a few, uh, being facetious, I've painted a few wedding dresses in my time. I think I've been doing wedding paintings for about 15 years. 2007? Uh, maybe not quite. Maybe 2009, so that would be what, 13 years? Something like that. Um, I'm, I've done, I don't know how many, over 150 weddings. So, the point being that that's quite a few wedding dresses. And uh, fortunately, I really kind of enjoy painting wedding dresses, partly because I've got this funny little artistic fetish, <laughs> if I can call it that, where I enjoy the challenge of painting white stuff, painting stuff that's white, things, objects that are white. Uh, in fact, I did a painting a few years ago. It didn't. It didn't turn out all that great, uh, just because it was too esoteric. It was a little bit too weird. Only an artist would think this was cool. But it was a. I had a photograph <clears throat> from among all my travels. I had a photograph of a 
ice cream plant factory. So it was, and it was painted white, kind of like you'd expect an ice cream factory to be painted. It's kind of 1940s, 50s era building, industrial. Anyway, so white building, white sky, <clears throat> with a white car on a white road because of the lighting. So I, I did it just for fun. It's, it was in my, in my daily art adventures there somewhere. <clears throat> um, so that was just a kind of a fun. So the, the how do you paint white stuff is I usually smart alecky <laughs> that's a an adverbial <laughs> form of smart aleck smart alecky uh, say to students how do you paint white stuff don't use white paint that's not strictly true of course my the point I'm trying to make though is that you don't reach you don't use the white paint until way at the end of the process it's the last thing you do. <laughs> and once you know, right when I'm saying that, I'm using almost pure white paint. So I'm, what I'm doing right now is not a good example of it. But up here it is. All right, now let's, okay, I'll correct that. What I just did sort of wrong, I'll now go back and do right. So I'm just on the same brushes, I just put a little purple, dioxine, violet, um, blue, brown, and a couple blues and a couple browns. All right. Whoops, I'm off camera there, aren't I? Sorry about that. Okay, hang on, hang on. Let's fix this. Let's move the camera a little bit. Sorry about that. So I was just doing some very scribbly painting, as you can see. Thank you, Brenda, for your kind words. Lynn, you remember the white painting? Painting? No kidding. That's amazing. Now, by the way, now I am obeying my rule of not using white paint. So the idea, let me go back and explain how to paint white stuff. Um, in my opinion, of course, this is the world of Dan Nelson, in which I suggest you emulate to some degree in, until you're better than me, which is could be a week and a half. Um, you, put, you paint in layers. And you put down a number of, well, other colors underneath your white paint. And you sneak your way up to using white and you, you try to resist as long as possible using, you know, what I'll, for want of a better term, I'll call pure titanium white. That's how you paint white stuff, white objects. And what I mean when I say don't use white. In other words, use a bunch of other colors first, and then finish, or well, just finish in uh, with white, with, I really should be saying very light paint. And what I mean by that is a generous amount of titanium white on your brush, but still gets mixed with other stuff. So very rarely do you paint with pure titanium white but having said that, I will say, yeah, but the kind of artwork, the kind of painting I do, that is to say, um, wedding gowns, I, I, do, I do break that rule myself a, a fair amount and, and use, at the very end, I use a tiny bit of pure titanium. Now, the, the rule would be never use pure titanium. That's kind of like a rule, like saying never use black. It's true to a point, and that's it is what most early journey painters need to hear. Um, but it's not strictly true, in my opinion. That the rule is always add warm, warm up that white. Don't use you know use a tiny bit, a tiny bit of yellow ochre or something, 
or Naples yellow, even better, in in that in those final dabs of white. And generally, I agree with that. Uh, the exception being possibly wedding gowns. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think now I'll do a little bit of a little bit of more light. I almost, and here I am when I say white, I am using um, the white in quotation marks. White, titanium white, and by the way, normally fast dry titanium. If you use regular titanium and get any impostor at all, like I did on a dress here, that, that would take two weeks to dry, very possibly. And hopefully it'll be dry by tomorrow. And if it were if I'd used my normal alkyd, it would be dry today. But I'm using up this stuff that I bought, who knows when. Again, fast dry formula. I don't know what they say on the back. Nope. Oh yeah, vehicle, alkali refined sunflower oil. So they have the word alkali, alkaline. Um, is your tip off that it's a fast dry, but it's not as fast again this is what I usually use. All right, so I am going to uh, do a little bit more white and I'm, now I am following the advice right now. A tiny bit of yellow ochre. By the way, if you want to warm up your your white paint, like the following the rule that I just said, the rule is you shouldn't use pure white. It's funny, there's two rules. Don't use black and don't use white. <laughs> kind of funny. Um, and generally, they're correct. Uh, usually, the white should be warmed up with uh, something. And, in my opinion, the, the thing to warm it up with is yellow ochre. ochre or, if you want to be even more gentle, so to speak, um, Naples yellow. I find I, in, Naples yellow is a regular on my palette. And Naples yellow is basically, and it's just a shortcut, uh, uh, yellow ochre would work just fine. But Naples yellow is sort of like a light yellow ochre. And it just saves a little bit of mixing. Anyway, the point I'm making is don't warm up your white with yellow. I mean, you could, you can, you could do it, but oh my goodness, it would just, it, it, it's like a, like a lemon yellow, cad yellow light, cad yellow light imitation, any of those bright Hansa yellow, lemon yellow, they're, they're so electric in their coolness, <laughs> that'll mess up some of you, um, that they'll, they'll really get in your way. Don't, don't ever st stick your brush in a pile of yellow paint and say to yourself, this is warm. No, because uh, it, it's only it's warm if it's a warm yellow. Those, uh, and again, I know this is just, just mess with some of you, because you simply learned that yellow is warm. Well, yeah, not, not so fast. Uh, and I can't imagine how many student paintings I've seen where I, the student stuck their brush in a pile of cad yellow medium, cad yellow light, lemon yellow, Hansa yellow, whatever, and imagined that they were adding warmth to their painting when in fact they were adding this freezing cold. Now, I'm Pete talking like a passionate artist, okay? <laughs> In the yellow spectrum, the light yellows are cool. Warm yellows are warm. So I'm exaggerating slightly, of course. But uh, though, for instance, here, let me pick up my palette just for a second and show it to you. So I, I have typically two yellows on my palette. Indian yellow, which looks very warm. It's almost orange on the palette. But when you make when you apply it transparent, it turns quite a very intense, yay, verily, almost a cool yellow. If you take Indian yellow and apply it transparent, it gets very bright. And this, of course, is a I don't know what it is, but it's a 
a light yellow. This, as you can see, I think of more, it's a green color. I use it to modify my greens more than anything else. If I warm, want to warm something up, I use yellow ochre, which is over here with the browns. Yellow ochre is not yellow, it's brown. Just like oxide red is not red, it's brown. You know that, right? Um, so, and here's an orange. Anyway, you can you can mix this with orange and get a warm yellow. But uh, this, be careful. This is, yes, it's technically warm, but no, it's actually should be thought of as a cool yellow. And that's a very important, very important distinction. Don't imagine just because somebody told you that yellow is warm. Don't imagine it when you stick your brush in that kind of yellow that you're using a warm color. You're using a cool yellow. And again, mine, mine is on the palette. I can easily paint a whole painting without using that color. I use it mostly to modify my greens because it's such a cool, that's such a cool yellow. And again, I know I'm, I'm messing up with some of you because you guys just, you just learned the simple formula. Yellow is warm. Well, yeah, it's not that simple. Welcome to second grade. <laughs> First grade, you learned that yellow is warm. In second grade, you learn like, oh, wait. <laughs> Same thing with blue, of course. There are cool blues and warm blues. All right, enough, enough, enough. That's enough of that. <laughs> I'm going, I'm, I'm doing a real fast rendering. By the way, and of course, I, I want my, uh, I want Sarah's dress to be fairly abstract. I want it to look angelic flowy, feathery, wispy, not, not like a hard piece of object, like a hard fabric, okay? So it'll, it'll stay. I'm, I'm probably 90% finished with it, or 85 anyway, with the way it is right there. And as you see, that didn't take very long. The last 5% might, will, might be coming back and doing some of the, I don't know what you call it, the little flower shapes, leaf shapes that are on it. I called it applique a little while ago. I'm not sure what it's called, but whatever that is. I'm doing some right now. And also, I'll, I may very well come back after this is dry, which evidently, judging by this, is going to be a couple days, and do a tiny bit of... Uh, pure white or nearly pure white highlights, right? So other than that, I'm probably finished. And as you can see, I very typically make my dresses um, fade out because, because it's glowing. I'm having a hard time seeing the bottom of the photograph up here. I'm getting a stiff neck looking at it. <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to call that good enough. So I may be done with this jacket and her dress. I don't know. Probably not. I'll probably come back and uh, work on it more in a day or two. But let's move on to something completely different, shall we? Let's go and start painting the, the, the next most realistic thing, which is the arbor that surrounds them here. Covered with flowers. Hmm. I wish I had, I, I might take, after the spark catch silver, I might go upstairs and uh, print out a, another version of this arbor. Uh, in this photograph, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to it way up here. In this photograph, I have sort of faded out the, the arbor up here because I, 
that's I want the painting to have that effect. But at the moment, I want to be I would like to be able to see uh, what it actually looks like. So I'm going to start painting the purple. So there's this all these colors are in the arbor. So we have white, I'll say white roses with a slight blush of peach, orange, and same thing, purple roses or with white edges or white rose with purple in the creases. And, um, oh, and blue, it looks like blue um, hostas, I think. So purple, light and dark purple. A few peach colored flowers and yellow. I said yellow and I meant blue. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to pick one color. Let's go with the, uh, the medium, the light colored roses. And so I'm mixing up over here dioxazine violet and uh, permanent rose which is a very, very cool cold red. And I want this to be, no, it needs to be redder than that. So actually a little bit of uh, naphthol crimson. So now it's a, a really a purplish red. Hmm, redder still, I'm surprised. And a tiny bit of uh, liquid just so it won't take too long to dry. All right, and I, this part, I don't have to, as you can imagine, I, I don't care that I, and I've already got stuff blocked in, in the acrylic stage, of course. Um, I don't have to match the photograph flower for flower, right? I'm assuming you understand that. I mean, that would just be crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm calling you, if you, if you, I'm calling you, you realist people, crazy. That's just anal, retentive. That's just OCD. There's no need for, for copying flower for flower. I do want to give the impression. I do want my painting. And it turns out, it turns out my acrylic underpainting is helping me a little bit because I, it turns out I have a number of these flowers already roughly placed in, in the right position, so that helps. And I am doing, again, the, the formula that I gave you uh, when I was painting Joe's jacket, which is anytime you're painting a, a busy subject, which is most of the time, really, so the only exception is flat sky, flat whatever, um, you do, the formula is medium over covering so to speak that the the whole area medium then dark details then light details it took me long enough to get that out didn't it spit it out then spit it out <laughs> quit don't bother me i'm painting <laughs> all right so there's there's all the there's all the purple-ish flowers. Now I'm going to just wipe these brushes off. Don't have to clean them. Just give them a wipe and mix up now a much darker version of that color. Whatever color that was that I just put down, reddish purple, purplish red. Now I'm mixing up a darker and also duller. So here we go. A little bit of my um, raw umber, my color killer. All right, I think that looks pretty good. And again, tiny bit of liquid, tiny, tiny, tiny bit. And now I want these to look like roses. So I'm just going to mostly tending toward the middle of each, if the rose is facing toward us, which not all of them are, of course. That would be rather artificial to have if every rose was pointed straight at us, we would go, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. So like here I have 
one, two, three, four roses that are we're seeing in profile, and three of them, four of them are more or less pointing straight at us. So same idea. Some of these we see in profile, three-quarter view, straight on and so forth. Uh, but the dark, well, the ones that are facing toward us, uh, of course, the, the dark is right in the middle. And the formula is medium, medium value over the whole thing. Whatever the object, whatever the thing is over the whole flower in this case. And then follow up with dark details, which is what I'm doing right now, and finish with light highlights, you could say, light details. And I am, as you can see, I am paying quite a bit of attention to the photograph. I'm not going to copy it slavishly, but I certainly do want to give a pretty realistic impression of what this arbor looked like. Jim is watching right now, I imagine, and I, I doubt that he, now he would be the only one that would because he's watching me do this. I doubt that anyone's going to put up a photograph and put up my painting and start counting roses, you know, to make sure I've got the right number in the right place. I, I'm, again, I'm being extreme, but as artists, we need to remember things like that sometimes. You know, when you're doing your painting, all right, I'm done with that. Wipe off the brushes again. Nobody's going to hang up the photograph on the wall next to your painting and ask people to give you a grade according to how perfectly you copied the, the photograph, right? And, and that's silly, of course. But I say it because sometimes we artists, we slip into thinking that way. It's like, no, I've, I've got to put it in there because it's in the photograph. You've heard me say perhaps before, I've been leading a, a group of painters for 16 years or something in, down, in, in downtown Raleigh or in the, in the region in the area. And uh, we've developed quite a camaraderie over the years and it's been a lot of fun. I used to tell people there's a wide range of skill levels but unfortunately that's not as true as it used to be because almost everybody that's been a part of our group for any length of time at all, they become much better. So, frankly, monthly when we get together, it's like, wow, there's some good paintings and good painters and good paintings in this group. That's really, really, really been fun. Um, but why am I mentioning that? Because the, by far, the most common so this is a, you understand, a picture, a group full, a room full of pretty good painters and, and or very good painters. And the most common mistake, if you will, that we catch each other in, you know, somebody will, because we're seeing each other's paintings with fresh eyes for the first time, of course, and we'll point to some part of their painting and say, what's that? Or why'd you do that? Or whatever. And usually at that point, the, the artist who's standing in front of us will roll their eyes and laugh and say, oh my goodness, I did it again. I put that in there because that's what was in the photo, including me, by the way. Like for instance, I did, this is a real example. I'm, I was painting one of my many, many uh, cityscapes, downtown Raleigh, the city I paint more than any other, of course, because this is where I live. I love painting cities, I'm crazy that way. And uh, there was this big black blob, big black rectangular monolith right in the middle of my paint. Well, not in the middle, but fairly prominent in the painting. And somebody said, what's that? <laughs> and I said, it's a magazine. You know, it's like a, a little kiosk that has free, you know, real estate brochures in it. And you know, one of the local culture magazines and go downtown Raleigh brochures and it, stuff like that. I don't know if you can picture it, but it was big square, dark thing. They said, why'd you put that in there? <laughs> and of course my answer was, my answer was palm the forehead. Like, yeah, that was dumb, wasn't it? <laughs> I did it because it was there. And in, in this case, it, was, it wasn't a photograph, it was plain air, I was standing there. 
why'd you put that thing in there? Well, because it's because it's there, and that was a mistake. I just and I did go back and just take the whole thing out, and the painting was noticeably better because it didn't have this confusing monolith right in the middle of it. So. <laughs> I, I think that's still one of the most common mistakes that most of us make is, I'll say, intermediate. Those of us in the intermediate phase of our art journey will put something in the painting because it's in, you know, unless you're doing plein air, because it's in the photograph, because it's there. So anyway, I don't need to do that. I don't need to do a, every flower. It's in the photograph. Not only would it be silly and a waste of time and energy, it would probably make it a worse painting. So what do I want to do? What I do want to do indeed is give the impression, the accurate impression of what this arbor looked like. Now I have a feeling just from where I'm at right now that my arbor, don't tell Jim I said this, that the arbor in my painting it's actually going to have a few more flowers in it than than was act than what is real. Shh! Don't tell Jim I said that. <laughs> Again, who cares, right? We want it to look beautiful. We want it to look nice. We want etc. I'm going to paint. Frankly, I'm going to paint in the painting what the florist or whoever did the arranging what they were aiming for. There we go. <laughs> what they wanted their arbor to look like. And it looks lovely, don't get me wrong, it's beautiful. But I can make it even, I have the liberty to make it even more beautiful. Or <laughs> so while I'm doing all this jabbering, you may be seeing, yes, I am, I am doing the white highlights on the pale purple, did I say white highlights? Light highlights on the pale purple roses. Okay, so I've just, I've just focused so far entirely on the light purple roses. I think they're roses. Yeah, yeah, those are roses. For a second I thought, well, maybe, wait a minute, maybe there's something else. No. If there are, there's some kind of exotic species that looks a lot like roses. I will not be held responsible for horticulture. <laughs> Not my job. I have to tell you what kind of flowers these are. They just have to look like whatever's in the photograph. So in this particular painting, because because of the way that it is, um, this arbor is in fact going to be a little more realistic than the backgrounds of my normal wedding paintings. And it's just because because of the composition, couple, arbor, that this is almost a part of them. Do you know what I mean? All this stuff back here will be my normal abstract realism. But the arbor just seems to me, it's so intimately connected, visually connected with the bride and groom that uh, it's going to have to be <laughs> In, in a sense, more realistic than I would like, or more realistic than I, my normal. Anyway. All right, I'm already done with those purple flowers. That seemed like a big job when I started, but it really wasn't, was it? Now, will I come back and touch that anymore? Maybe, those purple ones? Yeah, very possibly, very possibly, but also possibly not. So let's graduate now to really the the blue, and I think they're hostas, snowball shaped flowers. We have a couple in our front yard. These, you can barely see these big things. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're hostas. Um, and they're blue. And they are a cool blue, more cool than warm. So ultramarine is your cool blue. Let me mix up some of this and then see if it's pure ultramarine with titanium. Or should I add a tiny bit of um, 
phthalo to that. Oh yeah, a little bit of phthalo, which is really most often the case. Usually the blue is somewhere between. <laughs> so for the last 15 or 20 years, my habit has been, you don't have to do like me, but my habit is I have two blues, a warm and a cool, phthalo and ultramarine. I don't use cobalt because no, because I don't need it for one thing, but mainly, but um, because it causes cancer in rats in California. Now you have probably noticed that I do not happen to be a rat in California, so you know I'm not that terribly worried about it, honestly. But why take the chance? Just, just because I don't I really don't need it. So I don't use cobalt. And the danger, if you will, if there is a danger, the danger with all those... Okay, no, let me back off. Talk about danger in a minute. So what am I doing once again? And I'm going to end this broadcast shortly because you don't need to see me do this too many times. Okay, so it's blue, mid-tone blue. Then I'll come back and do dark details and finish with light details or light highlights. Right? All right. Yes, thank you. So... Mid-tone blue. All right, the danger of, of the, the heavy metal paints, uh, cadmiums and the cobalts, essentially, is that they absorb through your skin. And, and when do they get on your skin? When you're cleaning your brushes. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways where you have intimate interaction with the paint that you're not really aware of at the moment. At least most of us are not aware of at the moment. And that's, that's when you do have... Uh, some danger because let alone I mean, painting with your fingers or getting paint on your fingers and so on and so on and so forth. So if there is a hazard, that's, that's when the hazard manifests is uh, not so much when you're painting. I don't, I'm not getting this paint in my hands, but during the cleanup process and so on and so forth, it's very possible for that to happen. All right, so there, I think that's all the hostas. Again, I put a f in a few more than are actually in the photograph, no problem. Now, dark details, and in this case, the dark details are not very dark. Uh, just add a little more ultramarine, a little more phthalo, and a little bit of um, my color killer uh, raw umber, not too much. But I don't want this. I don't want this to be an electric blue, right? Okay, and then just little speckles. Unlike the roses, where the dark is deep inside the rose, here on the hostas, the the dark is actually on the surface of the flower. So that's quite different from the roses. And of course, the hostas are the, the petals are tiny, tiny. So um, I'm not I'm not painting petal for petal. I'm painting. Bye, sweetie. Bye. I'm painting more the texture of the flower than the letting the brush and the canvas interact to create a hosta-like texture than than painting or even thinking of painting individual petals. Whereas on the roses, I did do individual petals, as you saw. Okay, so that I'm already done with the first two layers. Mid-tone overall, dark details. Now, I think I can do this with these same brushes. For those of you who haven't seen before, by the way, yes, this is typical of me. Uh, silver Grand Prix extra long or long filbert um, what uh, there's my table tabaret full of brushes um, they're 80 90 percent filberts and and uh, my good other than the long handle ones um, 60 percent of them are uh, 
Silver Brush Company, Silver Grand Prix. Again, you do not need to follow me in that regard at all, but sometimes people want to know, what do you think is a good brush? There's lots of good brushes out there, but um, really, really good brush. Bristle, we're talking about here. By the way, just again, I guess while we're talking about brushes, for the last 10 years or more, I have pretty much avoided a synthetic brush. So this is an old leftover from the old days. I don't, I don't buy synthetics at all. Um, if, if I want to, because they don't last and they're whatever. Now that's just me and you'll find some other really good paint. Somebody who's way better than me. And I'll say, no, no, you should buy all synthetic brushes. Okay, whatever. <laughs> there you go. But no, I might, I, I don't, um, I don't like synthetic brushes. They don't last very long. I know they're cheap. And nothing wrong with using cheap brushes. No, I'm, I don't avoid them because they're, it, it, just because something is cheap doesn't mean it can't be a good tool. I and mean, think about it. <laughs> think about it, I like to say. Rembrandt, on his best day, didn't have a brush pretty much as good as you can buy it. You know, AC Moore or Michaels in the, in the on sale department. You know, you can buy a brush for made in China for, and buy it for a dollar. And uh, it's better than what Rembrandt had. So I don't, I don't get off on being all snobby about my brushes. At least I don't think so. But if you want my opinion, what's a better brush? Bristle, pure bristle and authentic uh you know, Kalinsky, um Sable. And I am wickedly mean to my Minister Newton Series 7 brushes. Well, just using them for oils. <laughs> it puts me in the wickedly mean category. They're a watercolor brush. And they're amazing. I've said this before, but if I think if you just go to YouTube and do a search for Windsor Newton Series 7. There's about a 30-minute documentary about the making of those brushes. <coughs> it's not a commercial. I don't think it's a real documentary, I think. But after watching the 30-minute documentary, I was astounded that they could sell them as cheaply as they do. They're, they're quite expensive for brushes, but it's amazing. They can go even for what they do. Hmm. Let me stand back. Yeah, I'm almost concerned at the moment that this is actually getting a little too busy for, for what it's supposed to be doing. So I'm actually going to never paint with your fingers. By the way, this is part of the reason that I don't use cobalts because you know I am going to paint with my fingers. What I'm doing right now is just basically taking the white stuff that I just put on the hostas and putting my thumb on it, then moving it around. So I'm actually using my thumb as a little printing device, right? Stamping, spreading out the white and making it a little bit more subtle because it all of a sudden it, I just got, you know what? That's a little too busy. I, it, I did a really good job. <laughs> too good of a job of painting those hostages. And um, I feel obligated always to say never paint with your fingers every time I paint with my fingers. But again, it's partly because I don't have cat co cobalts or cadmiums in my brush. Um, so I've got the two main. Now the next thing is dark purple roses or something like rose, like here. There's a dark purple one right there. Um, and then, of course, there's greenery and fronds of things. Oh, I know. Let's do. I'm gonna do one last thing before I before I go today. And it was touching up something I did last night. I have um, this little branch with little tiny purple flowers or little tiny purple leaves on it. Let's see if I can find 
yeah, so here's my photo reference. Right here, you see a little purple, I don't know if it's flowers or leaves, there's several of them. And I've got it coming across her white dress, and um, it's, it's too clunky. The, the, the purple lines are too thick and so on. It doesn't, it's not nice and feathery. Um, this actually gives me a, a good excuse to do some negative painting, which is always a good idea. Anytime you can, anytime you can come up with an excuse to do negative painting, you should. Uh, hang on a second, I want to raise it up a little bit. Bear with me while I... So I know this is, this is really finicky detail, but of course it's right here in the focal point. So I'm going to paint her white dress back over this little twig. Is my head in your way? No? Okay. Now, of course, as you can rightly imagine, I'm not going to be doing anywhere near this kind of detail throughout the whole painting. But because this is right here, of course, it's right in front of her breast, it's right in front of the, the, while I'm here with this brush, I'll fix up that. It's right in front of the, the brightest part of the whole painting is the sun hitting her uh, dress right here. So incorporating some pretty extreme detail right here, in my opinion, is quite appropriate. There. Much better. Now that looks like a little twiggy thing. And that right there is a good lesson about how to paint skinny stuff or small stuff when you're painting uh, in the world of abstract realism, that is to say not hyper-realistic painting, I, you know, because generally speaking you want energetic brush strokes, which I had, I mean, again, everything's relative, considering the size of the subject matter there, my brush strokes are quite clunky, energetic, and, um, and yet it didn't come off looking right, so how do you fix that? And the answer is you negative, you reverse paint, just exactly what, what you saw me do there, it's a good quick demo. All right. Thank you, gang, gang, for all your company and your attention. Let me see who else is. <laughs> the father of the bride is watching. <laughs> Jim, he says $912 worth of flowers on that arbor, so he will be counting. <laughs> Well, Jim, I, I've upped you to about $1,500 worth of flowers on the arbor. <laughs> it's our little secret. We won't tell anybody that you didn't have quite that many flowers. <laughs> Again, my, 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 my desire is to create the essence and, you know, air on the side of opulence rather than the side of realism. Everything. I, we do that in everything. I mean, one of the most obvious things in this in this painting is is I've taken her upper arm and made it narrower. I mean I feel like most people, even she won't necessarily look at it and say, Oh look, he made my arm skinny. If if she does react that way, then I go, oops, overdid it. You know, let alone anybody else. I just want her to look at it and say, dang, I look good. Right? That's and that's in my opinion, that is a portrait painter's this is different than a photographer. And the crazy things they do in Photoshop on for cover girls, you know, Victoria's Secret girls and stuff like that. And of course, they buy girls on the verge of starvation to begin with for Victoria's Secret. <laughs> and then make them even skinnier in Photoshop, right? I do feel like an artist is painting believable fiction. That's very different. A photographer is painting um, nonfiction. All oh, right, that's another story. But anyway, there's things like that. Um, I, I want their faces to look exactly like them. If I accidentally make them some feature like, ooh, it looks even better than the photographs, then that's fine with me. All right, thank you, gang. I have to go to work. <laughs>
Not that I haven't been at work for the last hour. Thank you for your time and attention and company. I appreciate it. Hello, John Malanzi Art. Well, good for you, man. Show us who you show. Tell, give us a link to see where you where you go. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you for your chats. It's always a lot of fun. I appreciate it. My other job these days, and and I, I will take you there eventually. I'm working on a uh, what is turning out to be the biggest art commission of my life. Really funny that it would come for a church. Six-figure income, I mean six-figure budget for this project. And I, my young friend Luke is working with me like a mentor. That's really fun. And it's a kind of a mural. They call it a mural. We call it a mural, but it's way more than that. It's three-dimensional, you know, Disney, Disney World kind of fabrication, which is probably the funnest thing in the world for me to do is three-dimensional fabrication. So I'll bring you up bring you up up there one of these days and show it to you you'll be dazzled <laughs> you will be be dazzled <laughs> all right thanks for watching i hope to broadcast tomorrow we'll see